Okay, Jalen, thanks very much for making yourself available again, and we look forward to today's presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Can hear you, just can't see oh, your presentation wonderful, yet. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, uh, John. And uh, I've um, put a, a relevant paper in uh, the chat box for everybody. So um, uh, my talk is an updated version of the contents of this 2013 paper. Uh, I'll now share my screen. Good. Is, is this good? Yeah, good to go. <laughs> okay, so uh, a few years ago, I uh, had the idea, um, I, I got a bit fed up because people were kind of picking and choosing what tomography images they showed and uh, um, kind of stretching things and uh, in, in, in order to bolster their claims that um, they'd seen a plume under some place or other. And uh, I was minded to write a quick web page and post it on mantleplumes.org. So on mantleplumes.org, I get people to um, summarize their work often in uh, about a thousand words in, in a way which is understandable to cross-disciplinary colleagues. And uh, I post it on the website. So if I see a paper on geochemistry or tomography or something like this, I'll often reach out to the author and say, could you write an accessible thousand word summary of this and post it on the website? So I'm using the website to try to um, facilitate people um, looking at things in a more cross-disciplinary way. But anyway, um, I was uh, rapidly uh, kind of uh, surrounded and attacked by uh, a large group of people who said uh, this is such an important subject uh, you can't just write a web web page on it this has got to be a full paper and very rapidly I got uh, an invitation to publish it in Terra Nova and uh, this paper came out of that so um, many colleagues and, and I myself felt that Tomography, although it's a wonderful subject that's done absolutely marvelous things and uh, taught us a lot about the earth, um, it tends to be overused. People, people want to answer questions and they use tomography to try to answer those questions instead of saying, what can tomography do? We're going to apply the method to do that. So it, the tail's wagging a dog, really. And um, once I got into it, I realized that there were many different ways in which tomography had got its problems. And uh, we really should be aware of these in order to um, sort of appreciate uh, the power of the, the subject. So um, I'm just going to turn on a uh, better mouse here so you can see my pointer. So first of all, when we do tomography, we box off an area like this, and we look at seismic rays coming in through this, this volume and uh, being received on seismometers on the surface. So we're studying a particular box, and intrinsic in the method is the assumption that there's no structure whatsoever outside the box. So this introduces errors. Uh, another class of errors is that, well, I say errors, but uh, they're not really errors, they're just kind of misleading things. So anomaly amplitudes can't be reliably determined. Uh, we're used to looking at um, pictures which uh, go from uh, blue through green to red. And uh, people often will say, oh, you know, there's a 2% anomaly here. And they'll translate that into differences in MGO or differences in partial melt or something like this. But um, the person who did the tomography could simply tweak a couple of run parameters and all the amplitudes would be different. And uh, it could be equally well argued that the data had been well fit. So this is something which is not widely known. Uh, there's very inhomogeneous ray coverage. And uh, when you look at any particular tomography image like this, there may be regions here which don't have any crossing rays. So um, in, in the, this, this particular one, there's, there are no crossing rays here. And yet this region here is still shown in green. So um, um, uh, people who are not tomography specialists may look at this and say, oh, there's no structure there. 
Um, repeatability is a problem. Uh, if you study an area, the Azores, Iceland, Southern Africa, or whatever you're interested in, and you draw together all of the tomography studies of a particular area, uh, you'll find that they're all different. Uh, reference models are another kind of sneaky thing in the background where um, people show an anomaly map like this one top right. Uh, and they have they've, what they've done is to do a tomography inversion, assuming a certain background reference model, and, and then they get their result out. But if you assume a different reference model, which might you know, equally yeah, be you know, within the realms of, of what the data um, uh, agree with, uh, you would get a different picture. You know, this picture here could be completely changed just by changing the reference model in a way which nobody could really argue against. Uh, displaying the results is, uh, I'm sure every geologist knows how important that is, and there are many different ways of displaying the results. If this is a cross section through uh, North America, so uh, the coastline is here, California is here, Nevada is here, Idaho here, Wyoming, Montana, and uh, North Dakota, uh, Minnesota. So uh, this is like a sort of roughly west-east cross-section across the Western United States. If you change the orientation of this cross-section by say five degrees, you would see a very different picture here. But of course the author of this paper has chosen that particular um, cross-section. Uh, then coming down to uh, the last one, combining tomography and geochemistry and geodynamic models of the mantle, um, this is kind of stretching things even more. Um, experts in the, the audience who, who, who are specialists in geochemistry will know that geochemistry can also be used in many different ways. Some things that geochemistry can tell us are pretty certain, but when you start to speculate about the, uh, the um, composition of the lower mantle and the composition of uh, the core mantle boundary layer, then it becomes a lot more iffy and uh, you can get into arguments with colleagues about whether your signal can be produced just in the crust or the lithospheric mantle or whether we have to go down to D double primed to explain it. So geochemistry suffers from the same problems as tomography and um, uh, uh, combining the two, um, well, <laughs> that I can produce almost anything you want, I guess. So I'm going to go through each of these uh, seven categories just to give you a flavor of uh, um, you know, how suspicious we ought to be about this. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the types of tomography. There are three different types of tomography really, well, four, more than four even, but there are three here. So one is teleseismic tomography, and this is often the method that's used to look for plumes. Uh, surface wave tomography, whole mantle tomography um, are also using um, earthquakes. So all of these three methods are using large earthquakes, which uh, send rays deep into the earth and come up to the surface. So these are all methods which are using earthquakes uh, of large magnitude, many around the Pacific Ring of Fire, of course, which go deep into the mantle and can be observed tens of thousands of kilometers away. And I'm mostly going to focus on teleseismic tomography, but much of what I say applies to the other methods as well. So this is the experimental setup. You take a bunch of seismometers and you lay them out on the surface. So here we have a, an example. So this is uh, got an uh, aperture of 160 kilometers. So it's 160 kilometers across. And we're looking at a cross section through the earth going down to 200 kilometers. So um, each of these bunches of rays, this bunch, for example, this is coming from one earthquake. Um, these steeper rays, this is coming from a different earthquake, different earthquake, different earthquake, different earthquake. So here we're looking at something like one, two, three, four, five, six, six or so, uh, seven or so earthquakes, uh, sending their ray bundles up, and each earthquake sends rays up, which are received on every one of our seismometers here. So what we want to do, we want to box off an area here like this, and we want to receive, you know, run our seismometers for um, a few months, uh, record say 50 or 100 
um, of these large earthquakes. And we measure the arrival times at the different stations. So if we take this earthquake here, for example, um, supposing there's a uh, low velocity anomaly here, supposing there's a huge magma chamber here and, and it's got low velocities. The rays that pass through that magma chamber will arrive late at these stations because it's passed through low velocity material. But the rays that have got have, have missed it, have gone around it and have arrived at the stations here, for example, um, these will arrive at the expected time because they won't have passed through the low velocity body. So if we just took one earthquake like this, we would say, oh, um, the, the earthquake waves have arrived at the right time here compared with our, our assumed model. Uh, they're late here, something slowed them down. And then over here, they arrive at the regular time again. So um, something um, on the ray path to these stations here has gone through something low velocity. Well, just with one earthquake, you could not tell whether those low velocities were anywhere down the ray path. In order to pinpoint it, you'd have to have crossing rays. So you'd have to have an earthquake over here, which arrived at the, with the rays arriving at the regular time here, being slowed at these seismometers here because they'd passed through this magma chamber. And over here, they'd gone around it and arrived at the regular time. So it's, it's really like, um, uh, it's really like um, plane surveying, if you like, uh, if, if somebody wants to um, find the distance away of a mountain, for example, you have to make uh, distance measurements from various different angles so that you can kind of um, uh, uh, pinpoint where it is. It's not enough just to measure the distance from where you stand to the object. You have to take it from various different directions in order to um, uh, uh, find out where it is. Um, so in practice, what we want to do is to get as many earthquakes from as many different directions as possible, all with their rays crossing through this uh, volume of interest that we have here. And then we can run uh, an inversion program to calculate the three-dimensional structure in this box. Uh, what is the best uh, three-dimensional structure with slow regions and fast regions that can explain the pattern of uh, arrival times from all these earthquakes at the surface. Well, the region within which, uh, this is a typical experiment that we're looking at here. These, these very distant earthquakes, their rays arrive at our aperture traveling quite steeply upwards. So the region within which we can get good resolution where we can fairly confidently, not 100%, but uh, the, the, the best possible situation, is shown by this inverted um, triangle here. So if we lay out an array 160 kilometers wide, we can see uh, pretty well down to approximately the same depth, 160 kilometers, uh, within the center of the array. Outside of this, the resolution is less good. Um, it'll be even more distorted. So this is the regions labeled fair here. And outside of this box, the resolution is poor. So for 100, 160 kilometer wide aperture, uh, we can see down maximally under the center of the array to 160 kilometers and underneath that nothing is really reliable. So the first lesson about this is that the Tomography program assumes that all of the delays in the earthquakes are within the volume of interest, within the box we're studying. If there's structure out here, out here, out here, 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 um, then uh, this, this, any, any structure here, any, any delay, for example, in this earthquake here, it's assumed there's no structure there. So any delay there will be pushed into our model. Um, another thing to bear in mind is that we're not inverting for absolute velocities. We're only inverting for differences from our starting model. So here is our starting model here. Uh, we've got a layer 5.8, 6.2, 8.2, and uh, 7.85 below that. So the, the, the program is giving us differences from those velocities. 
So you can see that this could be a problem if our starting structure is not accurate. Um, for example, if we uh, find that there's an anomaly here in, in, in this top layer, so there's a, there's a blob here in the top layer of, um, of high velocity. So the program tells us, oh, there's a region here where the uh, velocity anomaly is 0.2 kilometers per second faster than um, the average. Well, if we'd started off with um, a background velocity of six kilometers per second, um, the inversion would have told us that there was no anomaly here. So, um, you know, you can see <laughs> how difficulties could come in. Uh, another thing to bear in mind is that variations in the vertical aren't calculated. What's calculated, each layer here is completely independent of the other layers. So we often see pictures of, say, um, downgoing slabs which have been imaged that cross through several of these layers or, or plumes coming up which cross through several of these layers. But these have not been, all that's been resolved is the velocity anomaly in one layer and then completely independently the velocity anomaly in another and the velocity anomaly in another. So you would only have to tweak up the starting velocities a little bit and you could make any continuous structure appear or disappear or, or seem to be broken. Uh, correcting for the crust is not simple. Um, and uh, we have an example of that here. So this is a very famous study that was done of Hawaii. Uh, there were some stations on the island, but Hawaii is a very, very difficult place to study. Um, the island itself is maximally only uh, about 100 kilometers across. And you can immediately see a problem here. So um, people would love to see whether there's a plume under Hawaii or not. In particular, they would like to see if um, any anomaly under Hawaii passes through the transition zone and into the lower mantle. That's the kind of holy grail. Is there a uh, structure which punches through the um, base of the transition zone and uh, comes up from the lower mantle. But the trouble is the big island itself is only 100 kilometers across. And as I've just said, this means if you put a bunch of seismometers out on the big island, you can only image down to 100 kilometers. You can't go down to 650 kilometers, let alone further. So this experiment was done, very expensive, $5 million paid for by um, NSF to put a lot of ocean bottom seismometers out on the seafloor around, around the, the big island. So then there was the immediate problem of having to deal with um, correction for the crust and the surface, because see the, the ocean is very deep around here. These mountains are quite tall. There's even snow on the tallest mountain. Um, so some correction had to be made for the crust and uh, uh, the elevation of these stations. And uh, this diagram over here shows you those corrections. So uh, a big blue dot um, is a uh, minus two second correction and a red triangle is a plus two second correction. In other words, um, what people said was, uh, here we've got our network, here we've got our stations, but we have to add a correction in to the arrival times, all the arrival times to take account of the different elevation and the fact that the land stations are sitting on a huge pile of basalt and the um, ocean stations aren't. So you can see that the, the difference between these two is four seconds. In other words, when our teleseisms arrive at these stations and uh, they arrive at different times, and some of them arrive earlier than expected, and some arrive later than expected, we've already put in a, a, a variation of four seconds across the network just to correct for this, um, for the station elevations and the crust. So um, this is a cross section of the uh, inversion result, these S waves. So this cross section goes from the surface down to 2000 kilometers depth. So the base of the transition zone is at about 670 kilometers and that's shown by this white line. So the inversion showed um, a very strong 
low wave speed anomaly underneath um, Hawaii going down to about 600 kilometers or so. There's some structure on either side here. And it showed this uh, weak tail, which appears to go down to about 1500 kilometers. It's got a much lower amplitude than the, the main body. And uh, there's another one going across here. And uh, there are some other weaker features there. And the, the total signal, if you take a ray, which is coming up through this guy here and up through the main anomaly to the surface, um, the mantle signal, you know, the arrival time signal of that is about two to three seconds. This body represents a delay, you know, a slowing down of the um, uh, wave, uh, a late arrival of about two to three seconds. So this signal is of the order of the surface correction. So as we all know, if, if you're making corrections which are of the order of your signal, then you're in a, a weak situation because uh, any error in your correction could pan into a, a very large percentage of the signal. Uh, moving on to anomaly amplitudes. The amplitudes that we get are very dependent on the inversion parameters. You know, all of those sort of black box um, magic numbers that you tweak when you uh, say run to MOG. Um, damping factors, model smoothness, parameterization of the model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of choices have to be made before the inversion is conducted. And uh, this little diagram here can, it, it illustrates the problem. So uh, what these workers have done is to set up a theoretical model. So we've got um, a slow block here, you know, this might be a huge magma chamber or something pretty deep, but there you are. So this is uh, low velocity, high velocity, low velocity, high velocity, low velocity, high velocity, low velocity. And uh, what tomographers do is to invent a structure like that. And then they say, well, Supposing you know there was this structure under place X, and we recorded a lot of teleseisms, you know, most of them from around the Pacific Ring of Fire. So you shoot um, earthquake waves, you shoot seismic rays through this whole structure here. So you generate a synthetic um, data set. You, you, you pretend you've got seismometers here, you pretend you've got these earthquake waves, and you pretend you've got a structure, and you calculate what the observations should be. You then take those observations and you put them into your tomography model to see how well your tomography model would give you this structure. And uh, they illustrate this um, in, in this particular arbitrary experiment of theirs. But it does illustrate some problems which are very, very common, if not universal, in this kind of work. So first of all, the original amplitudes are not recovered and second, the size of the bodies are smeared up and down. They're, they're elongated up and down uh, because of the experimental setup where we have all the seismic rays coming up at steep angles like this. So in other words, and anything which these rays intersect will tend to get smeared back down along the rays. Um, and as you can see, the amplitudes are much lower than they actually were. So um, here's another example of this. Um, this is an actual uh, real data set of uh, Ireland. Uh, so there's a seismic network across the whole of Ireland. Ireland does extremely well uh, regarding uh, seismic monitoring, much better than Britain, I would say. Oops. This is going online, isn't it? Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> I've said it now. Um, uh, so somebody inverted a bunch of teleseisms to get the uh, structure underneath Ireland. And uh, this shows a um, uh, you know, technical graph, uh, the, the prediction of the error reduction versus the uh, um, complexity of the model. And you have to set you have to set a damping parameter. So each of these shows uh, uh, basically how you've reduced the error um, according to how you've set this damping parameter. So it's been set at 0.05 here, 0.2, and one. 
So depending on how you set this uh, magic number here in your tomography inversion, you can either get an answer which is fairly gentle, it's fairly simple with fairly um, uh, low variations in, in seismic velocity, or you can get one that's a little bit more complicated with a few things sticking out here and there and higher amplitude anomalies, or you can get a very complicated model here um, with, with very strong um, uh, amplitudes. And of course, one, one this is kind of showing extreme. Uh, most people would say, well, this, this is too simple and, and this is too complicated. The truth lies somewhere here in between. But there's still quite a lot of uh, variation in what you could choose for this parameter, um, even staying within reasonable grounds. But this does illustrate how just by tweaking a parameter inside the program, which uh, people who are specialists in other subjects, such as geology, structural geology, um, volcanology, uh, geodynamics, um, geology, people who are specialists in other subjects and not tomography um, would not immediately um, kind of uh, appreciate so you could uh, ha have these parameters, uh, this parameter at various levels. And in particular, you come up with different anomaly amplitudes. So somebody, somebody looking at something like this, I would say, wow, you know, this is a very strong um, anomaly. Uh, the, the anomaly is maybe up to 5% um, uh, or something like that. So of course the tendency is then to immediately interpret this as variations in temperature and translate that even into uh, uh, degrees centigrade, or to say, well, there must be partial melt down there and calculate the percentage of partial melt. But of course, you'd get a radically different answer if you use this one, this one, or this one. And uh, nobody can say which is correct. Um, another thing to see in, in looking at this diagram is that the main large scale features. So we've got a high velocity here, we've got low velocities flanking it. And we see that in all three of these diagrams, low velocity, high velocity zone, low velocity. That's a robust feature of this data set. But these little bits and pieces here, this thing here, this thing here, these things, this blob, that blob, that blob, those are not robust features of the data set because you see them in one result, but if you just simply change the damping parameter, they immediately disappear. So these cannot be trusted. Uh, inhomogeneous ray coverage is a problem. So when performing teleseismic tomography, uh, the, a, a large amount of the earthquakes that we record come from the Pacific Ring of Fire. This is where all the downgoing slabs are. And of course, there's also a bunch in the Alpine belt here. But people often uh, compare tomography. They say it's cat scanning the earth. And, and, it's, and they say, well, it's like when you go in hospital, maybe you've got a tumor and uh, they'll cat scan you to get a three dimensional um, image of your, your head or something like this. But that's a bit of a misleading uh, um, kind of example because uh, if you've got a, a brain tumor and um, you went into hospital for a brain scan, um, the, the medics would not put a small bunch of sensors on the top of your head and then put the, uh, you know, send, send the uh, signals from an array on your shoulders. Uh, your entire head would be surrounded by sensors and uh, signals would be sent from, from every uh, place surrounding your head. But when it comes to the earth, uh, the situation is very, very inhomogeneous. Uh, we just have big teleseisms to a first approximation from this ring and the Alpine belt. They're all shallow. Um, they, there's, there's nothing that goes deeper than about uh, six or 700 kilometers. And there's very few at that depth. And the seismic stations that we have are also very limited in the case of the whole earth. So there may be lots of seismometers in North uh, America. Uh, obviously, a much worse situation in, in countries which are uh, uh, not such a sophisticated developmental stage. Um, 
There are lots of seismometers in Europe. There are very, very few seismometers here and extremely few seismometers in the two thirds of the world which are covered by oceans. So as a consequence, we've got a very inhomogeneous uh, sampling of the earth. And uh, this means that um, any diagram that you see of the whole earth, um, which has not got lots of areas blacked out is misleading in as much as it's not telling you where the image is, is uh, high quality and where it isn't. So um, there's an example of uh, how this uh, kind of caused difficulties. Um, this blockbuster paper was published in 2004 in Science and uh, sort of um, took the geological community uh, really exciting. You know, suddenly there's a paper published in Science um, saying that plumes have been imaged going all the way through the mantle. And uh, what these workers had done was to um, develop an improved method and they then thrown global data into it and they had imaged uh, lots of low velocity regions like this and they published this paper showing that they had imaged low velocity regions that went from the surface, so this is under Ascension Island, um, all the way down to the core mantle boundary and they claimed that these were, were plumes that passed through the entire mantle. Uh, many you know, of course, everyone thought this was very exciting, but um, seismologists in the know were shocked that this had been published because A, it had not gone, gone to any seismologist for review before being published. And B, everybody had known about these features forever. And they knew that these features were there because of inhomogeneous uh, ray and station coverage. Uh, simply put, uh, these workers discovered a plume underneath every seismometer on every island in the ocean. So there was a one-to-one -one correlation between seismic stations and plumes. And what was really being imaged here, this wasn't the difference, this wasn't the difference between a, a tall column of low wave speed material and in, embedded in normal material. What they were seeing was a tall column of rays embedded in a region where there was no data. So if you just change the background um, uh, model, for example, you could have immediately made these go away. And one can only guess that if you put uh, you know, an OBS out in the ocean over here, you would immediately have found another plume. Um, there's also the problem of inhomogeneous earthquake co coverage. So I've shown you this diagram here, and um, uh, this shows where the earthquakes are. Okay, so many of them are in the Pacific Ring of Fire. Um, the blue and the green and, and uh, um, peacock blue ones, these are the deep ones, and all the orange and red ones are shallow. So, you know, it's, it's if, if you, if you uh, kind of consider that we're, we're sitting on a globe, this is a very restricted, uh, places for these earthquakes. And so we'd, we'd like to study Hawaii in the middle here. And, um, you know, H Hawaii is very strange in that it, it's capriciously, it's in the most difficult place in the entire globe. I think it would be easier to study if it was at the South Pole, even the North Pole. But Hawaii is in the center of the Pacific plate. There are virtually no earthquakes in the mass of the interior plate. But all the earthquakes essentially are coming from this circle roundabout, which is more or less equidistant. So if, if Hawaii is here, just about where my nose is, um, the earthquakes are out here. Their rays are diving down into the earth and they're coming up underneath Hawaii like this. And if you think in three dimensions, they're actually coming up in a kind of skirt around Hawaii. The very region that we want to study, the area immediately underneath where a plume would be, is not sampled. So this makes it extremely difficult. And when this inversion was done by, by um, the, the authors of this, this work, um, because the rays were all coming up like this, like this and like this, and there, there are no rays coming up under here at all, uh, what they had to do was to use um, core bounces, um, 
earthquakes that uh, occurred over uh, in Chilean trench, for example, bounced off the surface of the core and came up underneath Hawaii. So they used these additional phases. And uh, this uh, feature here is essentially a bundle of rays reflected up from the core with virtually no crossing rays. And this, this is essentially the same. So um, I discussed this with a uh, um, person, Adam Zwonski, um, this happened just before a San Francisco AGU, and um, he's arguably uh, the, the um, most senior earthquake tomography expert in, in the world, uh, sadly deceased now. And um, I said to him, I, you know, Adam, you know that this isn't right. Um, you know, what are you going to do about this? And, and he said, who can criticize a $5 million NSF project? In other words, yes, he knew this wasn't correct, but um, you know, he's going to make themselves unpopular by standing up and, uh, and saying this. It's sort of embarrassing, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, so it took, uh, let me see, when was that study? That was 2009. It, it, it took um, nine years before somebody sort of had the guts to do something about this, if you like. And uh, they published this uh, uh, piece of work here. Uh, where they did this thing that I described before. They took a theoretical plume. So, okay, suppose there's an, just an upper mantle plume. They uh, took the earthquakes that the previous group had used. That's these earthquakes here, as you can see, they're in this nice ring here. And they shot rays from these earthquakes through their theoretical model, and they got theoretical arrival times. They then put these arrival times into the tomography program and inverted it to see what the pro program would give you. And the program gave you that. So um, here is the um, uh, result that was published along the same cross section, northwest, southeast, That's this red one. And you can see that exactly the same essentially was, was obtained. So there's, there's a very strong body in the upper mantle. And there's this long smeared thing, which results from the bounces from the core, the rays that bounced off the core. And this is imaged here. And uh, this work even imaged this thing over here, which is this, and this thing here, which I guess is this. And it even imaged this, this strong uh, high wave speed anomaly on that side and uh, this thing over here. So obviously it's not 100% exactly the same, but um, you know, this just really blew it out of the water. But of course, there are still many, many, many references to this paper and nobody ever references this paper. Moving on to repeatability. Uh, so this is the S-wave tomography image uh, from Hawaii. And this is the P-wave tomography image from Hawaii. So um, even in the same experiment, S does not agree with P. And um, if, if there's anybody here in the audience who, who thinks that uh, this here looks like a reasonable geological structure, then uh, please put your hand up now. Um, I'll move along quickly here, hoping there'll be some time for discussion. So, um, this compares that 2009 result with something published in 2008, uh, which, whereas this one shows uh, a supposed plume tail going off to the southeast, this one shows a, a purported plume tail going off to the northwest. So, um, I think Lee was a, a graduate student, something like this. The second author was a, a senior scientist. So um, I collared him at an AGU meeting too, and I showed him this picture and said, what have you got to say about this? These cannot both be right. You know, you've got your name on this paper saying that this is a Hawaiian plume. And he said, neither of these models are resolved. In, in other words, you know, neither of them are reliable. So, um, I'll be very interested to hear from the audience advice, how to deal with a situation where people won't point out if something's wrong because the experiment costs a lot of money, um, or, or they're 
quite happy to have any old stuff published with their name on it when they know perfectly well it's not correct. Uh, Yellowstone, it's the same story. Uh, one study shows a fairly uh, shallow anomaly under Yellowstone going down about 100 kilometers. Another one shows this anomaly going down 200 kilometers with a bit of a tail here. And again, it's the same story in these cross sections here that you, you see an elongation of these um, features in the direction of rays. So here we can see uh, anomaly here, anomaly here, anomaly here, anomaly here. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, this, this is smearing along the direction of the ray. Uh, Yellowstone is tremendously studied because of course it's smack in the middle of a continent and a uh, very economically prosperous country. So there've been gazillion experiments done there. And uh, in recent years, so the experiment called US Array swept across America where the whole of the United States was, was covered with seismometers um, over a, a, a period of a number of years where uh, some 400 stations were put out in, in a swathe in the West and they were sort of success, progressively moved across the entire country. So there's a tremendous lot of data for Yellowstone. And uh, a group led, led by Gary Pavlis did a huge piece of work where they took the results from several different groups. So, you know, all these data were in the public array. Lots of different groups could take them, they could test their tomography, they could run inversions, and they published papers showing the structure of the United States, and, you know, the upper mantle and the United States. So, what these workers did was to get the results from all these different groups and render them to the same parameterization and the same color scheme and draw the same cross section through all of them. And uh, because everybody's got a different format, everyone's got a different color scheme, everybody's got different software, everybody's got different block size or different way of uh, parameterizing their structure. It took a year of work to take these six models and draw a cross section through all of them that was comparable. And you can see that all of these are different. Uh, they all feature a, a strong, there's a big red, yellow arrow where Yellowstone is, by the way. Um, there's a strong slow anomaly uh, to the west of Yellowstone and uh, in the North American craton to the east of Yellowstone. So um, that's visible here. And this tremendous change in structure is visible here. The same here, slow, fast, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. So all of them see that, that's the big scale thing. But if you look at the smaller scale things, they're all different. Okay, this is the most plume-like one here. Uh, this just got a few blobs here. This has got one big blob and more or less nothing out here. This has got a fast blob here. Um, and uh, this has got a couple of little blobs here and, uh, and a fast body here. So. Even, even when different groups are using the same data set and basically fundamentally, you know, in principle, similar methods, um, once you get down to small scale details and larger depths, there's no repeatability between the results. So this can only mean that uh, essentially all of this is noise because it's different in every result. And uh, this is the situation under my favorite place, Iceland, where we have a study here from uh, 1999, where um, uh, one group said that they could see an anomaly going all the way down to the core mantle boundary under Iceland. Um, this inversion uh, shows an anomaly which stops at the base of the transition zone, 650 kilometers. Um, this one shows a strong anomaly, which is only about 300 kilometers thick. So this is 600 kilometers thick. This is 300 kilometers thick. And then something very weak here. And uh, this is perhaps the most recent result from the uh, Romanovich group, 
where again the very slow anomaly um, in, in the shallow mantle under Iceland is shown to be just 200 kilometers thick and there's a bit of a blob in the uh, transition zone and underneath there is just some pretty weak stuff. I could show you more which are different but um, I'm sure you get the picture. Um, so I'll show this one. Um, this is a transect across southern Africa. Uh, this paper illustrated uh, the, so this shows absolute wave speed, okay, from 4.2 to 4.9. So this shows absolute wave speed, these, these are the actual numbers. And these two show what the anomalies look like if you use different reference models. So one reference model here has got a, a, a low velocity zone in between about 300 and kilometers, about 100 and 300 kilometers, and this one doesn't have this. And if you if you subtract either this model or this model from from the original, you obviously see something very different. And um, most people who are not specialists in tomography are basically interested just in looking at this anomaly map. So you're studying a bushveld or something like that. You want to know if there's an anomaly under bushveld. You you pull this out and you oh it's a great it's a great big blue thing. There's a high velocity body here. Well, let's run away and uh, interpret that in terms of petrology. But you could equally well have been looking at this and you might have got a completely different impression from that. So the result can just be whoosh, completely changed depending on which reference model you choose. Um, okay. I want to allow time for discussion, so I'll skip over some of this. Unfortunately, it's all just... <laughs> I feel like the the um, prosecutor for the uh, uh, prosecuting attorney or something. So uh, we could also make things look very, very different just depending on what color scales we choose and what cross sections we choose. So I've just shown you this one uh, of Iceland. So these workers, they drew a cross section through sort of Denmark, Iceland and, and Greenland out about here. And they showed this cross section here, which shows a low wave speed anomaly going all the way down to the core mantle boundary. However, some other workers, they, I mean, people are very generous. They will give, give away their models and let other people look at them. But um, this other group got hold of the data and they extended the cross section. So they made the cross section longer. So let me see the, the cross section on the left is from about here to here. And these workers extended it down to the Middle East and extended it over to Canada, and they drew it up like this. So here, and this is exactly the same model, just drawn in a different way. So here you can see um, a low wave speed anomaly here in the upper mantle. Um, there's just a very weak tail down here. And this weak tail is, is no different from something over here, which is, uh, kind of about under Turkey and something here, which is under Hudson Bay. And it could be argued that this feature under Hudson Bay looks exactly like a plume, a mushroom plume, uh, much more so than this anomaly over here. The difference between these two images is that this cross section is extended. So, so these people, they, they probably saw this and they chopped it off. Okay, and furthermore, this picture here has been, the color scale is saturated at plus or minus 0.5% of anomaly. This cross section is saturated at plus or minus 3%. So what's going on over here is that the strength of the anomaly up here is up to five or even I believe 10% in places. But in order to make this look continuous, they've saturated it a bright red, anything that is over 0.5% of anomaly. Whereas here, they've saturated it at 3%, so you can easily see that this is 3% or greater, and this is much weaker. So, so this, this has not only uh, hidden similar features um, where you wouldn't expect a plume to be, 
but it, it's made it look as though there's a continuous structure when in fact that this is tremendously weak and this is tremendously strong. And um, if anybody's feeling lost, here is something that is very, very simple and um, my five-year-old granddaughter would uh, be able to understand that and that is the issue of vertical exaggeration. Um, this anomaly here, so this cross-section here runs through the Azores, Cape Verde, um, SL, I can't remember what that is, Tristan de Kuna. So it's running down the mid-ocean ridge from um, north of the Azores down to Tristan de Kuna. And it was suggested that this is a plume under the Azores Islands, but the vertical exaggeration is 10. So whereas this is the anomaly that was claimed to be a plume, if we remove the vertical exaggeration, it looks like this. And uh, of course, this problem is well known in geology. So um, I'm going to stop there because I could just go on forever. And uh, I'm going to invite people to um, discuss if, if they care to. Thanks, Gillian. I think we've all gone into mourning for the death of geophysics and particularly <laughs> tomography. So, so, so tell us, that, you know, does tomography still have a place and where can it be used? I think it should be used to target problems that it's capable of targeting. You know, it, we, we can't look for small things deep in the earth. It just doesn't work. Um, and um, I, I'm sure geologists and geophysicists amongst us, everybody with our own specialist subject, we, we know that our own specialist subject can do certain things for us and solve certain problems. But it, it, if, if somebody comes along and um, says that, you know, I've just lost my portfolio on the stock market, can your geochemistry help me with that? You'd say, no, sorry, it's not a suitable tool. Okay, and, and just um, carrying on on that vein, tell us, you know, give us an example where, you know, you, you, you could point to a genuine, um, you know, positive use of tomography. In, uh, in well, a, I mean, we, you know, we, we seeing huge discussion and problems going on with regard um, 3D seismic profiling, you know, around, around our shores. Um, and when, you know, when you look at how the, the, I guess the oil and gas guys have used it, you know, it's amazing. And, and, but that's, you know, that's quite shallow. And we also have other, you know, drill holes in that where you can check the, the, the interpretation. Well, exactly. That's, that's not teleseismic tomography. So yeah, um, sure. first of all, you're putting all your sensors out exactly where you want them. Um, you're putting your sources out exactly where you want them. You don't have complications like um, the source is going off when you don't expect it and you haven't measured the uh, time. So an another problem with earthquakes is that you don't know you don't know the exact time that they occurred and you don't know their exact location. You have to calculate those things. Whereas, of course, with um, active seismics, you put the source exactly where you want it and you let it off and you time the explosion. And of course, as you say, you've got you can ground truth it with boreholes and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's also another key philosophical point here, John, and that is that um, when you do industrial seismics, um, getting the right answer matters. You know, when you think of it, it doesn't really matter if plumes exist or not, does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe, you know, maybe it does matter, you know, where's, where's the next imminent lip that's going to sort of, you know, pop up under a continent or, or well, plume? Somebody should write a play, paper saying, do plumes matter? Okay, well, I mean, in, interesting points. Anyway, so, some discussion. So, you know, the, the industrial people, they're, they're expected to get the right answer. They make sure that they... They make sure that they're on firm ground where they, they interpret their results and uh, say what they've got. And, uh, and they're expected to, um, you know, if, if somebody says, oh, there's a reservoir here, let's go ahead and exploit that. Then they expect there to be a reservoir there. Everybody's fired if there isn't. Well, it's well, you know, it, not it the case sound, And we'll get back to Lou. It does also sound that you're saying we shouldn't trust any geophysics, you know, anyone who's done geophysics. Lou Ashwell. John, the, the, the question I, I was going to ask Jillian was, was uh, asked much better than I would have by you. 
and so I've got most of the answers to um, to what I was interested in. But uh, I, I I will say that Jillian's talk was a very lucid um, explanation for the caveats, the limitations of of tomography stuff. Um, you know what what I think she showed is that uh, in any given potential plume site, by tweaking a few parameters, you could you could image a plume or not image a plume, uh, depending perhaps on, on what your personal bias is, scientific bias. And if that's the case, which it seems like it is, then, uh, then this becomes entirely unscientific exercise and you might as well just give up looking for plumes using, using tomography. So um, maybe Jillian will, will agree with that. But it, you know, if 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 you take the position that um, by changing a few parameters in a in a paper that that claims to have seen a plume, uh, then you 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 could you could you could say well then it doesn't uh, it, it it possibly is untrue. There's no plume there. But on the other hand, uh, you could go the reverse direction. You could say that uh, in a, in a place where there's a there's a big volcano and there's no uh, evident piece of tomography that that uh, indicates a plume. You could say, well, change the parameters and maybe you can create that plume. So it becomes a bit of a waste of time, I, I guess. I guess that's what you're trying to say, John. Um, what what I would ask is um, of Jillian is that which which features in the Earth, and I think you've asked this the same way, John. Which features in the Earth are robust in terms of tomography? So, for example, Jillian, would you would you accept the uh, the LLSVPs, which appear on everybody's models, uh, as as robust features? And uh, a, another another question would be, what about the um, the nature and extent of uh, of subcontinental keels? The uh, you know the the, the craton boundaries at at depths are much shallower, a few hundred kilometers maybe. Are those robust? So maybe you can make some comments about that, Julian. Uh, yes, I think those observations are robust, Lou. Um, the LLSVPs do exist. They appear in every inversion that everybody's done. Um, uh, they've been multiply, you know, uh, checked. I, I think. I suspect people kind of place too much store on them because they're in fact very, very weak features. You know, we're just talking about um, a, a very small percentage of deviation from the global average. So anybody who's got <clears throat> some sort of uh, vision of the LLSVPs as, uh, you know, this great big lake of regular peridotite and a great rock standing in the middle, completely different material. I think that is, uh, um, that's not a good way to visualize them. They're very subtle features, you know, representing a very small deviation from the average. Um, as regards studying the lithosphere, I think that's a good application of uh, tomography because, um, you know, the lithospheric keels are large objects. Um, they have relatively high velocities, which um, for reasons I, technical reasons I won't go into, it's, it's easier to, uh, image a high velocity thing than a low velocity thing. Um, so yes, these are, are large scale things which uh, are clearly seen um, across multiple different studies. And, um, you know, this, these, these are features that are reliable. I mean, I think, I, I think the first thing to do, so uh, the reason, you know, years went by without people kind of questioning tomography is really because uh, to begin with, somebody would go out and they'd do a tomography study of Iceland or Hawaii or something other like that. And then people would look at other areas. But we're now into the realm where multiple groups are studying a single region. You know, that, that wasn't possible before. Every time somebody went out and studied Yellowstone or something like that, that was the very first um, time it was done. And people didn't then just simply go and repeat the experiment because you know, NSF would say, oh, it's already been done. We don't need to repeat it. Go, go and look at something new. But now we do have multiple groups looking at the same regions and we can see where 
different groups find the same answer and not. So um, the first thing I would look if I was studying a new area is to um, see how well different studies agree. What about shallow places like spreading ridges? Can we see magma chambers? Uh, it's difficult, Jim. Um, the, the, re the reason it's difficult is because um, we're often, uh, you put out your array, you record a bunch of earthquakes and you measure the arrival times of the waves, okay? So um, we assume that the rays, are, you know, in the simplest case, we assume the rays are coming along a straight line. But uh, if, if there's a slow body under there, okay, so some ray coming through it is, is going to um, arrive later than it should, what happens is it's overtaken by a ray that goes around it. So this means that you could have a low velocity body and you wouldn't see it because the arrival times you're measuring have all you know, gone around it through fast stuff and arrived before the direct ray. So um, it's difficult, but anything that's shallower and smaller stru structure is uh, a smaller, anything that's shallower and smaller is easier to image than something that's very deep. Now, most of my talk is uh, aimed at um, teleseismic tomography, which is trying to image hundreds of kilometers down. So you'd say that if you do an experiment where you're shooting and designing an experiment where you're making artificial earthquakes by sending off, by shooting off explosives somewhere and you have multi-channel seismics and all of that stuff, you can, and presumably geometrically, um, take into account these kinds of variability, this kind of variability, and maybe image something that is actually real. Uh, yeah, yes, you're, you're in a much, much stronger situation there. Um, because uh, you know the exact instant the shots are fired because you've timed them and you've put shots exactly where you want shots to be and you've usually blanketed the area with with hundreds if not thousands of seismic stations so you're in a that's a much much stronger experiment than the tomography which is used to look for plumes right yeah Mark, yeah. um, I mean, you've got some so a good comment to make. Do you want to elaborate or show yourself? Mark, are you there? Uh, what are you saying, me? Oh, no, no, sorry. Yes, hello. Mark, got it. Mark, good art. Hello, John. Can you hear me? Yeah, go for it. Uh, firstly, Gillian, thanks very much. Uh, I'm a geologist. I know zip about tomography. I just read the papers now and again. Uh, so I really did find your talk enlightening because I've attended quite a few seminars where people present this and it looks like an answer um, and you've indicated to me how uncertain the answer can be. So I would like to say thank you. Very good. Stephen Haggerty from a Kimberlite point of view. Um, good to see you this morning again. And um, I, I guess those of us who sort of have studied kimberlites and the lithosphere, we also have a great um, advantage here in Southern Africa or in, in many parts of the world where we have all these wonderful mantle nodules, um, you know, which you can also use almost as a draw, as a draw core sample. Anyway, your comments, Steve. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Well, I thought um, Joel was convincingly skeptical and uh, educational, so thank you, Julian. Um, yes, I think you, you, I mean, you selected uh, what you like and, um, and, were, and were suitably critical of it. So I accept that. Um, but with regard to, to John's uh, comment, um, I made, so made the comment yesterday, and that is that, that the heat source has to be deeper than the deepest, deepest diamonds. And um, so I think the only way to do it is by, uh, Morgonian, a Morgonian plume, and um, so. But with regard to to imaging that, um, I take your point, and uh, and they're good points. So uh, the, the teleseismic uh, imaging clearly has has problems. I was happy to hear that um, that imaging the uh, the the, uh, the keels under under cratons 
uh, is uh, is robust and, and convincing. So um, I think we have to deal with uh, uh, accepting that um, uh, that there are uh, perhaps um, shallow plumes, maybe, and certainly more convincing. But the deeper ones are, are clearly uh, are clearly a problem. But with regard to kimberlites, I don't see how there's any other way of producing them apart from plumes. So that's my comment. You, you, you're being very polite this morning, Steve. I guess um, it's Thursday again. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's oh, been thank you. A polite and fair. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Andy Moore? He's still there. Yeah, Andy. Oh, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, just looking at the tomography images that you get from the carp vial experiment, or going back one stage, if you, if you look at the uh, nodule data, it says that um, the, there should be a major break at around about 150 kilometers. Uh, that, that's where you got the old kink geotherm. And, but anyway, wherever the sheared peridotites come from. But uh, that certainly is not shown in, in the tomography images across the carp vol. So that seems to be an example where, you know, the, the ground truth thing just doesn't work. Or uh, am I missing something? Um, one slide that I skipped over was the slide where I stated that there are three things which can affect seismic wave speeds. Uh, one is phase, either mineral phase or you know, solid or melt. Uh, the second one is uh, composition, often you know, MG or something like that. And the weakest of all is temperature. So temperature has a very weak effect on seismic wave speeds and seismic wave speeds are much more strongly affected by um, those other two uh, um, parameters. So um, if, if you're looking for a temperature anomaly and it happens to coincide with a small compositional anomaly, for example, and you could easily just not see it. You know, every, everybody, um, everybody, <clears throat> Not everybody, I shouldn't say that, but um, many people look at tomography images and uh, they think they're looking at geological images, but they aren't. We're looking at, uh, you know, variations in seismic wave speed. And these variations can be brought about by three different effects. Um, the phase of the material, in particular partial melt, a, a smidgen of partial melt will collapse the wave speeds, huge reduction. Um, Variations in Mg will affect the wave speeds quite strongly, and temperature is just a, quite a subtle, weak effect on wave speeds. When people are talking about two or three hundred degrees difference in potential temperature, isn't that enough to affect the wave speed? Yes, that will affect the wave speed, yes, but um, uh, how, how do you know that's occurring? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> because you've looked at some tomography image and you've interpreted the uh, amplitudes, <laughs> you know, when that was just not justified. You know, I think most of the uh, differences in temperature that are derived from petrological considerations are, are wrong. They're, just, they're bogus. They're, the uh, techniques that are used are, make assumptions that are just, just not applicable in nature. So uh, the chief one being well, two chief ones being homogeneous mantle compositions, start the model, your petrological model. The other one, um, uh, uh, well, that's, that's, that's one to start with. Um, uh, the, the mantle is quite variable in composition, and there are lots of different factors that go into making it variable, and to assume one, homogeneous composition and two equilibrium conditions of partial melting and subsequent fractional crystallization when so much else is going on like assimilation and mixing are not right. They don't work. Well, I, think, I think most of us would agree with that. Lou? Yeah, taking, taking this stuff back to uh, some of our discussion yesterday, uh, Jillian, if, if partial melt is uh, 
pretty much easy to see uh, using tomography, then wouldn't sh surely we would have already seen a layer of partial melt, uh, extensive one below the lithosphere that you uh, are using to explain some of the volcanism or all of the volcanism in, in plume, plumey things. Can you comment on that, please? Uh, I think people haven't specifically looked. Um, it, it may be that these things are ephemeral, that they're not there all the time, because we know that um, lip volcanism has not been regular throughout geological time. So it may be that this is not something that's there perpetually, but I, I don't think people have looked for it. And um, I think that's, that's one thing that should be done. Uh, it, it reminds me of um, uh, when the downgoing slabs were first suggested. Um, somebody said, uh, oh, you know, this simply can't be right. There can't be a downgoing slab of, of uh, oceanic material because uh, earthquake waves would travel very fast down them. And then we would see um, early arrivals at X, Y and Z seismic stations. And, and we don't see those. So uh, some uh, um, kind of ignorant grad student uh, wandered off uh, um, to check up on this and found that we did see them. It's just that nobody had kind of taken any notice. People, had, you know, because they weren't looking, they didn't see. Okay, so so lots of future work for young students um, on, um, on on all of these topics that we've been discussing. So um, be be good to see you know what happens in twenty and thirty and fifty years time. Not that too many of us will be around at that point. Anyway, any any last questions, discussions? Um, uh, yeah, just in one, mind, hmm? just one point. One point, John, is that. Um, uh, people looking at nodules always interpret the sheared nodules to reflect um, a horizontal change, you know, it, it, it extends horizontally. Um, you know, that's going back to the old Boyd interpretation, but uh, Mercier at, at the second Kimblite conference yeah. suggested that this was just a narrow envelope around the um, uh, the, the Kimberlite and it was caused by shearing at the time of, of eruption. And, and this seems to have been ignored, but it's a very critical question if you want to yeah. use nodules as, um, you know, your ground truthing. Yeah, good point. Well, when you see xenoliths that have textures ranging from protogranular, which is to say little deformed, to strong porphyroclastic, even uh, cataclastic or basic kind of fabric. Uh, um, they all come up in the same same swath. They come up in the same uh, eruptions. Um, what does that mean? It, I don't think it means the the lava coming up did that. I think that means it was there before. No. <laughs> yeah, Fred, Steve. They're from different depths. Okay. But, but, but the stuff was there before. The stuff was there before, right? It existed before the eruption. Well, no, um, Mercier, Mercier would say that that's such an ephemeral feature. Uh, it's not a long-lived feature, but uh, Mercier is a Frenchman who, who's a very good uh, crystallographer. So... Um, that that goes way beyond my understanding, but that was his comment that it's a, it's it's an ephemeral feature. It's not a long lived feature. All right, Stephen, last comment. <laughs> <In addiction. laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone. Blooms forever. Neil Phillips, do you want to to sign off? Um, let's see, he's put a, go for it, Neil. No, no, probably not. I don't have much to say. Um, okay. my, my knowledge goes down to about four kilometres depth and my thinking down to about 10. So I'm way out of my depth when we talk about 500 kilometres. But I, I am certain that the messages, Gillian's 
brought out through tomography have much wider application to our geoscience, the, the way we get things wrong, um, the colours we use, all that type of stuff. Thank you for a great talk. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Um, James, you're in, you're in the hot seat next week. Um, yes, I so we, look forward, we look forward to, you know, you've almost got to do the wrap up. So, so uh, we, every time I listen to one of these, I figure I have to change my talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. And change the colors as well. So see you next week. Yeah, thanks, Gillian. Thanks for another stimulating talk. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks for everyone welcome. for the comments. Um, yeah, so don't forget next week again at eleven. And um, again, um, don't don't forget to, to please pass on information about the Geo Congress that we talked about earlier in um, in January in Stellenbosch. Is that thanks the International everyone. Geological Congress? Yeah, that's our sort of, um, you know, I think normally it happens every four years and then COVID got in the way, but it's been resurrected for... It's the IGC, right? No, 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 this is the um, Geo Congress of South Africa. Um, oh, okay, okay. You know, I just need to know what to look up on the web. Yeah, if you just go to, go to the GSSA, Geological Society of South Africa website, Jim, okay. okay. Um, you'll you'll find, and you've got to look down. If, you know, you, you'll see forthcoming events is what you look at. Thank you. Great. Okay. Right. Martin's just also put something on the on the chat box if you want to quickly have a look. Um, but again, I, I I will also circulate information. Thanks, Martin. All right. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your thanks. day or night or or mornings, and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Right. Well, now, thanks, thanks, Julian. Great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Julian.